ahead of vehicles where I can show you every feature that um, you want to see. And in fact, in the Q&A, I'll pull this back up. This is a long video. It's really neat to watch the lane markers pop up at exactly the right places. But you can see even through things like trees or buildings or cars or roads or hills, I can see where you want to go. And so you can actually do the cool experiment like, I wish I could see my destination 600 miles away as a ribbon that goes out you know, into infinity. We can do that now. Um, but the problem that we have is that this video, for example, has 60,000 data points coming at you in terms of potential pieces of information. We do not have algorithms or even capability on most modern vehicles today to handle the amount of information overload that's coming to you. And in that sense, I want to talk about a big data challenge. When we go out and map with our vehicle, we generate about two terabytes of data every day that we do mapping. Okay? That's a lot of data. Okay, it takes us about a third to half a day just to get the data off the vehicle just by copying hard drives over. Um, to put it in perspective, the lifetime output of all the data from the Hubble telescope is 25 terabytes. Okay, so in 10 days on a vehicle, one vehicle driving around mapping, you generate as much data as the Hubble Space Telescope over its entire lifetime of operation. Okay, that's crazy. The other thing too is like, if you have 10 vehicles driving around every day, they generate about as much data as Facebook. Facebook has about 25 or so terabytes of data that, that's on Facebook right now. And so you can imagine trying to populate everybody's feed on Facebook with 10 vehicles every day. Okay, so a Facebook a day. Um, if you took every vehicle out there and automated them and then collected all the information in one spot, you would require about, by my estimate, 100 million NSA spy programs to collect and go through and sift all of that data. We're at the point now where the data volume is just incredibly large, and we don't really know how to compress or deal with that type of, of, of volume of information. Um, and we really sorely need tools to do so. The advantage of the tools are that you can start doing things like virtual driving. We have a lot of discussion with, um, for example, uh, commercial truck drivers. The role of our commercial truck drivers right now is in excess of 90% of the drivers each year leave the, the, the workforce because they're away from their families. It'd be wonderful if a driver could log into a vehicle remotely, drive the vehicle for eight hours, call into a, a telecom system saying, I'm getting tired, pass it over to, to Joe or to Mary and then they take over operation of the vehicle for another eight hours. And when they're tired, pass it over to another person. It'd be even more awesome, for example, if we have two people driving that vehicle. If it's hazardous cargo, maybe we have five people that are logged in the vehicle from five different data sources. So if one of them falls asleep or sneezes or has a, you know, an inattentive disorder, then they can collectively average or weight the, the inputs together. We're at the point where we're starting to be able to do that. And as we get more comfortable with using augmented reality systems, or vehicles that drive each other around while we're telecommuting, we're going to become more comfortable with using artificial environments as our social interaction. The generation that doesn't want vehicles anymore, they don't want them because they have learned to be social without having to go cruising in their vehicles. Um, and I'm smiling because you can tell the generational difference. There's some kids that are in the audience that are like, what's cruising? Um, the older folks, cruising is getting a vehicle when you're 16 and finding a place in town where everybody drives so you can meet um, away from the parents. Today, that's called Facebook, okay, so, or whatever is the new generation. Um, I've also talked about the fact that these algorithms that keep vehicle in place, the vehicles can become regularly spaced in patterns that can destroy our infrastructure. I can set up resonance patterns by choosing the spacing of vehicles on bridges such that I can cause a bridge to oscillate up and down in terms of patterns. So I can take a, a vehicle algorithm and destroy a bridge in maybe a year or two that was supposed to have stayed up for, for 100 years. And here's the scary part. I might not know that I'm doing that as a mechanical engineer. I don't know what the bridge resonant frequencies are for every overpass um, in town. And these are some things where we have to have very, very good coordination between different disciplines to figure out this before all of our infrastructure is destroyed by a wayward algorithm. The other thing to be sensitive to is that these black hole issues, if we are using dragons, there are things, or are using maps, there are dragons on the map. Um, there are things like event horizons and black holes of information where it doesn't matter how many signs you put up if somebody approaches a traffic jam. If the signs are less than, in this case, a kilometer um, away from the jam, there's nothing a driver can do about it. So what? We talked a little bit about the virtual driving. And one thing that I'm concerned with is as we get to the point where drivers are used to driving around virtually, why would you get in the car anyway? Okay, if you're having a virtual interaction, you should be able to do all of your work from, from a, a virtual workspace. 
And so we might get in a situation where the only vehicles on the road are the ones that are delivering goods for just-in-time delivery, um, or for very special occasions where you want face-to-face meeting. So um, I think this is the last slide. Um, I would like to say that I have answers to a lot of these problems. And, and the sad part is that we're stumbling across these issues uh, inadvertently as mechanical engineers. And I know I've talked to civil engineers and, and logistics experts. We really need the tools and the collaboration and the cooperation to, to systematically discover these as we, before we roll out these large strategies. I would hate to be in a situation where we've got two or three years of, of driving information of automated vehicles out there and we suddenly discover that we've destroyed our entire infrastructure or we've created black holes of information. Um, and so I think we're in the wild west and in a very innovative time and I really think that the multidisciplinary innovation is the way to go um, from here on. At that point, I'm very happy to take questions and I thank you for your attention. You've been a good audience. Yeah. simulation studies yeah. um, or you know even highway layout algorithms um, and that's something where unless you know that you're looking for that type of result it's very easy to not do the simulations that would be necessary yeah. to find that so. um, and this is where you start seeing the notion of systems of systems of systems I can help tune my vehicle dynamic algorithm or even change the way the automation is tuned based off of the highway infrastructure layout and so these rules of like one kilometer are meaningless because I can always change my algorithm such that it works well. But I think the point that I'm trying to make is a bigger one is that it's better for me to think about how to tune that algorithm or even from the highway design standpoint understand the limitations of, of how I could tune the algorithm um, such that we can work together. Uh, because um, if we blindly design the algorithm, we could blindly be in situations for certain highway segments where there's always going to be congestion. Um, and there, I think there has to be an interplay between the two. But I'm just saying that uh, the interrelationship between that algorithm and infrastructure set is important. It's exactly. Not, it's, uh, exactly. Not. So the other things about um, the uh, the beginning is not about that you are simulating that uh, how uh, the interaction and moving inside the vehicle. You can say it exactly where are you are located in the roadway and. That the, uh, the precision is going to be about 10 centimeters, and this is important as mm -hmm. everybody knows for automated vehicle. But the thing that, and further on, you said that how much uh, right now the differential GPS are precise to go to one centimeter. Um, my point is, what the, the something that I don't understand, what the use of that algorithm? When that, that's a good question. So, like, when do you not need more precision? Yeah. I, I get that question a lot. Um, 10 centimeters is kind of like the magic number for vehicle dynamics because it's about the width of your lane marker. And so drivers do notice the difference between you being on the inside of the lane and you driving on the lane. And so most drivers are aware, if we take you out on the highway, of a vehicle that's veering right to left by like a lane width. Smaller than that, you're basically just getting more and more robustness. So I wouldn't say that vehicles even need one centimeter. Um, if you are, for example, trying to avoid a collision and you say, well, one centimeter will let me avoid a collision, whereas 10 centimeters does not, I would say you're probably too close to the object. I, I want to have more than a lane width of space between whatever I'm going to collide with. And so you, your, your point is a good one. So for, for me, I think 10 centimeters is really where you need to be at for, for automation systems. 
because that's, that's the length of the lane marker. And that's also the resolution that you want to get when you're looking at the outside world. You want to know that you're seeing a particular lane stripe, you know, a double lane stripe, but not a single lane stripe, for example. So 10 centimeters is usually as vehicle dynamics is what we use. But there's not a magic number. Yeah. Uh, we, my last question, sorry. Uh, the, because I'm uh, doing so much study on the pedestrian and bicycle safety and do it, uh, all of this uh, is related because I just heard so many uh, people vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure. How about our pedestrian and bicycles? Uh, what's the yeah, strategy Yeah, that's, on that's that? a hard one because the, for those that don't know, there's, there's mandates that are coming out that vehicles have vehicle to vehicle communication systems, um, dedicated short range communication radios, DSRC radios. Is um, there's a lot of question like how do we deal with pedestrians and um, I, there's some interesting research on things like using things that people are already carrying as methods of communicating to the vehicle but this is something where the infrastructure might be the, the trusted medium to do that and I think that is beautiful research it's an incredibly hard problem to find pedestrians in cluttered environments um, somebody that's standing to you know, on the side of the road looks a lot like a bush if they're wearing like a green jacket and it's snowing outside and, and things are cluttered. Um, where these maps help you is that you can identify where to look for people, um, and, like what you expect in the environment. Like a bush was there yesterday, a bush is there today. Wait a second, I don't see a bush there, you know, tomorrow. I see a, a bigger blob and, and maybe that bigger blob is a person. And so, that's where I think some of these the informational technology things can help because you can look at what's called change detection. Look at areas that are commonly cluttered, commonly populated by people and bicycles and program the algorithm to slow down for the driver or in an autonomous vehicle. Expect this environment, look around here for pedestrians or bicycles. Um, it's the equivalent of almost like a blind spot warning system, but that's always active. You're always going to be expecting bicycles coming in this direction from over in this spot and from this direction over there. And so, um, but perfect detection, I think, is going to have to rely on something. I'm just saying that they are in process because you are in the vehicle company and uh, more than me. So I'm yeah. <laughs> just I'm saying that they started doing because right now uh, Mercedes, BMW working in the uh, so many uh, very advanced automated vehicle. But I'm um, just saying that I didn't see anything on that side. Um, yeah, I think there's, there, this is where we're starting to get into a cultural change of, instead of selling you a vehicle, we sell you a service. Yeah. Um, and you're seeing that, for example, with Zipcar. Um, I'm not trying to sell you a vehicle for an hour. I'm trying to sell you a capability. And the reason why that's important is because in the past, there's been a lack of, I think, financial motivation for OEMs mm -hmm. to do stuff that's off the vehicle. They're not interested in installing sensors on, you know, uh, intersections for collision mm -hmm. detection. Um, they're in interested in s selling new sensors that are mounted on the vehicle. And I think we're starting to see a growing interest in how to take vehicle technologies and infrastructure technologies and merge them a little bit better. And that's primarily motivated by the increased use of fleet operations. And I think that's going to only grow. Like it's, it's in, it, That's going to be where that push comes from because a fleet operator would be facing liability concerns that are due to both vehicle operation and infrastructure interaction, whereas a, a private vehicle seller, someone who's selling you a vehicle, you know, relinquishes liability once that vehicle drives off the lot. And so I think um, over the next 10 or 20 years, you're going to see a lot more interest from OEMs in developing fleet solutions, fleet management solutions, than developing a product that you're going to sell and, and then you'll be um, liable for on your own. So, that's a great question. Yeah. Others? Yes, sir. Oh, um, what would be the challenges in um, operator behavior and transition from automated system? Oh my goodness, um, that's a great question. That is one of that is ten thousand dollar question there. Um, the question was, what are the challenges in, in I think operator engagement with the system? Mm -hmm. um, for those of you that have studied human behavior, this is called canny valley or uncanny valley um, of behavior, where if you're inter interacting with a system that's human-like, you want it to become more and more human-like up until the point where it has near human intelligence, then you really start feeling like it's fighting you. It's somebody that's disagreeing with you. And then if it's acting just perfectly like a human, you start to like it again. And there's this um, issue of engagement where people don't like computers to think for them, 
They want them to be like a, a trusted co-pilot. They want them to be either really human or enough robotic that you can predict what their behavior is. And so there's going to be this situation where we go through where things are going to get more and more automated, and then you're going to hate them for a while, and then we go completely automated like a chauffeur. Um, the challenge in that, that valley as well is that if a vehicle is doing most of the work for you, like the throttle and brake, how do we keep you engaged? I mean, I can't be in a situation in a car where, okay, I'm driving at 60 miles an hour, I see a collision coming up, it's going to happen in 0.753 seconds, um, I've calculated that there's nothing that I can do as my algorithm, okay, I've turned it over to the driver, it's, it's on you. That's very unethical in the standpoint of I'm relinquishing liability to you, and you might be, you know, checking your email or reading a paper. You don't have time to even understand the situation. So the notion of handoffs from an automated vehicle system or even a semi-automated vehicle system um, in terms of the driver engagement is a huge one. Even a semi-automated vehicle or driver assist system that allows increased disengagement of the driver will, could potentially increase accident rates because it's just easier and easier for you to get distracted. This is such a pervasive problem in things like aircraft um, uh, operators. Now it's going to become vehicle operators. Again, it's one of those things in terms of human factors design. It's, it is the question on, on how to do this. The vehicle industry is very quickly moving from the standpoint of once we automate the vehicle, there has to be a handoff protocol that is long lasting and very established that will give you seconds or tens of seconds to re-engage to the system. And so the, the paradigm that's starting to pervade now is that the vehicle will pull over the side of the road in the case of that emergency and say, this is why I stopped, you're going to have to take over. My sensor is bad, my actuator is bad, I don't know what to do, I'm lost, you take over. Um, but not put you in a situation where you have to make those life and death decision choices you know, in split seconds. And so, again, this is like the question on how to do it is one of those unsolved answers right now. Okay. It's just a really good question. Now, labor-wise, um, what would be the transition, say, if you have to maintain a driver as like a fail-safe? Um, That's an interesting question, too. Um, and, and a good example of, of where that would come into play is like the astronaut core. Um, it's possible today to send experiments up to the space station that are more or less automated. So why are we sending humans up into space? It's costly, dangerous, deadly, you know, etc. The, stand, the purpose of the astronaut in outer space is to understand the system well enough that under guidance, usually for mission control, they can debug and, and fix things and keep the system going to the point where they can bring it back home. And that, I think, would be the role of the driver in the future. You would probably sleep in the cab most of the time. You could check email or whatever. But if the system goes down, it is simply unacceptable to just park the, the vehicle on the parkway and let the traffic go around you while a repair person you know, comes up and fixes your tractor trailer automation routine. There's going to need to be drivers in um, particularly the large vehicles that could potentially block you know, entire highway routes. And so there's, I envision in probably 10 or 20 years, there's going to be a fleet of operators that, almost like mobile hotels, that you sleep in the vehicle, and your, your role is more of repair person and not necessarily primary operator. The primary operation is going to be dialed in, but you still have to have somebody on the vehicle that knows how to operate the vehicle um, and that can come in at the moment's notice. But you don't have the fatigue issues associated with on the time, you know, on the clock, constant operation of that vehicle in a rather boring situation. So I, I really see that we're going to have to go through that transition pattern, and, and uh, you know I'm curious to see how we're going to do that as well. So, um, but the space program is probably, I think, the best example of, of what you're probably going to see as we go to this, these increasing levels of operation. Sean, how's your time? Um, your... I have to catch a plane in an hour, so um, the, the real question is, I don't want other people to be stuck in here, so I, mean, I, I can answer questions one-on-one, -on -one, but... Uh, or as a group, it's up to you all. Uh, I'm more than happy to have a good discussion for an hour than uh, sit in an airport. Mm -hmm. so. well, I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, so we're hearing uh, auto manufacturers say they won't have an autonomous vehicle by X day. What are they saying? What are they really saying? Because they're saying it sounds that like there's so much still to resolve. Right. To predict when you're going to be there. Exactly. They. Um, the interesting thing, though, and, and we joke about this among faculty, is that they say 15 years ago in 15 years we'll have an autonomous vehicle. 
10 years ago, they said, in 15 years, we'll have an autonomous vehicle. Five years ago, they said, in 15 years, we'll have an autonomous vehicle. To me, the level is not one prediction out, because they'll always say 15 years from now, we could have an autonomous vehicle. I'm actually interested in how that, that prediction out is shrinking. So now we're hearing things like five years out, we'll have an autonomous vehicle. Now I think your question, Steve, is one more of when, what do they mean and when should we really expect them? Most OEMs mean automation capable vehicles in five years meaning that we are a line of code or a button press away from being able to do nearly all of the vehicle's operation um, through code. And so when I hear a company or an OEM saying, in 2016 we'll have automation, automated vehicles on the, on the dealer's lot, they mean that if we have all the legal issues figured out, we have the infrastructure in place, and society accepts them and demands them, we can meet that demand. Okay. Does that mean that we will have automated vehicles in two years? No, I, I don't have that illusion. I really think that we're looking at, personally, probably 10 or more years out for that to happen. But we are getting to the point, technologically speaking, where we are, where we are button presses away from, from being able to, to do that type of high level automation, meaning 95 or more percent of the operational, uh, operational situation of a vehicle, it, it would perform just as well as um, and uh, the hard part, though, is um, I talk. Have everybody here, anybody know what Six Sigma is? Where you get 99.999 percent reliability. Um, what is a human's sigma in terms of, of error rates? Okay, a vehicle typically samples, samples just as a rule of thumb about 100 times a second. So how many times does a human sample have, have to make the right decision at 100 times a second to avoid an accident? Um, in order to achieve the same accident rate or, or fatality rate of a human driver, humans are like eight or nine sigma. It is incredible how good human drivers are, uh, given the, all the situations that we have to deal with. Um, and so coming up with an automation algorithm that is like eight or nine sigma is just incredibly hard, almost impossibly hard. And so the transition into a claim that the vehicle will always be better than all drivers all the time yeah, we're decades from that, I think. But so you have to take the statements of automation, you know, relative to an understanding of what they're meaning. They they often mean that we, we could use it most of the time in this situation if there was demand, if the legal issues were figured out, if most other vehicles were also automated, if the infrastructure system supported uh, V to I, uh, vehicle to infrastructure communications or vehicle to vehicle communications. If all these ifs are lined up, okay, you can buy a car that does this. And I think that's usually what they mean. Yes? Um, so, I, I, you know, what you're saying is what I'm going to lazily call full automation is, is decades away. But one of the things that struck me when you were talking about lane, lane marker sensing and just map, map comparisons and how you use Bayesians to get to the midpoint, more or less, is that that can be used at a much earlier date if you get the challenges, if the data challenges, if you get, get over those. Maybe we have... You know, maybe the car isn't storing as much because it's it's got a data uplink and, right. and it's only accessing the map it needs and, and comparing to the map it needs. But that that could be an immense tool for policymakers and for infrastructure managers to identify. Even human need. factors. Like one of the problems that we have with putting people in driving simulators is that you're familiar with the route that you drive day to day. It's hard for me to put that route in a driving simulator. And with these maps, I can put you in familiar environments and test you under those same environments. We've even done an experiment where we put a simulated environment in front of a driver in the vehicle. We black out all of the windows. So you're driving in a driving simulator that is in a car, and the car is responding to you. So as you're driving around and the virtual world is going by you, that virtual world is the world around you, mostly. And we can start doing things like putting other vehicles in that virtual environment that may or may not be real, but you don't know that. But you're getting all the cues. And so we do have the capability of giving people information in ways that we never have been before. And I think there's a lot of commercial viability for that. Even Google Street View, I mean, I've seen it happen even in, in my students where I don't know where I'm at. Let's do Street View to figure out, like, okay, where were we at? Or we sometimes forget to note, like, where we take data. Um, and so we will go to Street View and then look around and we're like, oh, okay, well, we're going to tag this data with the name of that restaurant that we started at, and so we can find that restaurant off of Street View. So you're right, there's a lot of really neat applications that I think are 
huge advances compared to what we have now, but that are not full automation. Yes? You mentioned data storage as one of the challenges you face in collecting data. What are some of the you know, overarching blocking and tackling business challenges to this vehicle as a service becoming? Um, trust uh, and, and bandwidth, guaranteed throughput. Um, how often do you update it? Uh, compression is a big issue. Uh, how do I give the right data? I don't want to be streaming a lot of information that you'll never use. So if I live in Pennsylvania, why should I be uploading maps to California? Um, the only reason to do that is if I plan on driving to California, but even then I've probably got a week to do that. Um, I don't have to do that at a moment's notice. So don't tie up my bandwidth with information that I don't need. Um, the trust issue is one that we personally, I don't think that the public vehicle is going to go out there and build maps. Um, I think that you're going to have to have a trusted vehicle fleet, and this is where working with like trucking manufacturers um, to do that, or fleet operators is rather important because they can maintain their own equipment very well to a level of calibration to achieve a certain standard. The public at large needs to be able to communicate, and they can do that almost at a moment's notice, about changes in the infrastructure when you have map disagreement. So they will tell you when your map is wrong, but they won't tell you how to deal with it. And that's when you'll bring your mapping vehicle out, get to a particular construction site, map it within the next half hour to an hour, and that way you know, you can use that, that particular environment. But I don't see a situation coming up here anytime soon where the public at large is allowed to update the maps. Because of issues of security, it would be easy for me to say, OK, bridge is out. No, it's not. It's it's open, and so let's just guide the autonomous vehicles right off the bridge, and you know, <laughs> talk about like a, a you know, an, an anonymous terrorist attack. You know, that would be a horrible thing to do. Or even something more subtle. Why don't we retune the cruise control algorithm so that the spacing on these trucks is exactly the resonant frequency of that bridge? Okay, you wouldn't notice it for years, and so these are the kind of things where. You know, academics and industry planners, um, transportation system managers and operators really need to understand that. The other one that I'm concerned about is as we start getting into these large vehicle platoons, like thousands of vehicles, it would be very easy for me to sit, get in a situation where I command a disassociation of two platoons that are coming into an intersection of interstates, such that they all disassociate, go under human control at the same time. And what used to be an inter-vehicle spacing of, let's say, one or two meters, now suddenly has to be tens of meters because that's what humans need and then suddenly occur an instant traffic jam. I can command traffic jams to occur within the infrastructure by the way that I communicate to the vehicles. And that's rather dangerous. Um, and again, we talk about the waterbed effect. The increase in performance always comes at the cost of an increase of sensitivity to something that's usually unexpected. And the trick is trying to figure out what you expect to be that unknown signal or unknown cause. So on the database side, I, I think that we're going to solve the volume issue. Like, Facebook works really well. Um, Amazon servers work really well. You know, Netflix, you know, they, they move tremendous volumes of data. And we're only going to get better at that over the next five or 10 years. Um, but the security is something that we haven't done well historically yet. And uh, we need to figure that out for the systems. Uh, the other one I think that nobody really talks about is some um, anonymity. We're going to get to a situation where I think I can, my, my kids will be able to Google, for example, all my trajectories from 20 years ago here soon. There's no reason to delete that information. There's a lot of impetus for keeping that information in terms of advertisement. And so um, it's just going to become the standard, in my opinion. If you're on a road, assume that your position and privacy are, um, are gone. Like People will know that, and it should be public data. Um, and one example of how that used to be is just go back in time. Like 200 years ago, we used to be able to walk around a public place called a little town Everybody knew who you were. There was no anonymity, and we did that through mental maps. Computer systems will have the same type of infinite memory and location awareness as the general public used to have. And it's only been historically modern times where you've been able to be anonymous. And we're going to lose that anonymity again soon. We're all going to be well-known citizens of each other's communities here soon. Yes? I think we should just go around the room and just have everybody <laughs> If you need to go, I don't take it as an insult. I, I, this is a good discussion, but I, I don't want to feel like you're, you have to stay. Yes? Sure, I didn't introduce yourself, by the way. I think you should know who you are. Oh, uh, my name is T.S. Vegas. I've been here at UIC for the last 15 years, and I work on uh, many of the software sides of transportation planning issues, human behavior, and other aspects related to it, and public transportation. And 
my question is along the lines of what my background is and points out to your statement there. And so I'm curious to get your insight. And this might draw you a little bit outside your comfort zone, but bear with me on that. Uh, you say that the answers in the future can only be obtained with interdisciplinary collaboration. And have you given any thought to what transportation planners should be working on that will complement what you guys are doing on the vehicle dynamics aspect of it. And to tie into that, you also mentioned in one of your earlier slides, legal and ethical concerns. Where should legislation be? It's always been shown that legislation is either a couple steps behind innovation, in a lot of ways leading to some tragic consequences. Um, so it's really, a very broad question. It is a broad question, and, and this brings up a, um, some ethical issues. And you are being recorded. <laughs> um, I'm okay with that. Um, we had a discussion last night, for example, um, and a traffic, let's use a traffic jam as a surrogate example. If I record information about you in terms of you're the wild driver that caused a traffic jam, and I have that recorded information, you might not actually be aware that you're swerving back and forth caused that traffic jam. Years from now, I can analyze that traffic jam and, and show that the person in the ambulance in that traffic jam would have gotten to the hospital had you not swerved. Are you now liable for the death that, that was caused because of that action? And so we had a good discussion last night at, at UIUC um, after, after my talk there on that exact question. How long are you culpable for actions that have been recorded that are, are really our life or death? Or maybe they're not. Maybe they, they have issues. Our legal system has been one where you have a time horizon over which you are responsible. Um, and the thing that was interesting and that I was talking about last night is, is computer systems don't think that way. The recording of data in the present and the recording of data in the past, the way that computers operate, is equivalent. And so ultimately the question of legal liability is how to deal with, with issues like that. Now in the short term, you, you asked the question of how can like transportation planners work with vehicle um, groups. I, I can tell you personally, the software that we use, for example, to do vehicle simulations does not integrate well with like uh, microsim or uh, traffic simulations. Like just there's an immediate need for ways of bridging even software domains. So that, like interface um, issues. Yeah, there's just some very basic interface issues. Vehicles run things called common filters or observers where they can make estimates of where they are in, in, in an environment. It's very difficult to prototype how that vehicle's um, algorithm will interact with other vehicles that have maybe similar or different algorithms, or whether or not you get algorithmic to algorithmic interactions. We don't have ways right now of certifying worst case scenarios. There is no definition right now of what are all of the scenarios a vehicle must pass in order to be certified for public use. We do not have what are the worst case situations. Um, I believe as academics, and one of the reasons why we're starting to record these maps, we're only going to find them through example. Um, I think if we just come up with idealized cases, they're going to be just that, and we're going to be missing some of the more profound things. When, one of the cool things about, for example, the Shark 2 study, the naturalistic driving study, is it really illustrated that human drivers are very, very good. The failures tend to take place when you get combined operations. Like the human reaching down to pick up the CD while the vehicle ahead of you was slowing down at just the wrong moment, the person glanced up, the vehicle was speeding away. They looked back down to pick up the CD, but that glance up didn't see the brake lights. And so you see situations like that, which are a compounding of multiple effects. It's not going to be a single test. It's going to be a situation where the situation itself caused that accident. And the thing that I get concerned about is, you know, we've got 100 million plus vehicles that are active every day. You know, we've got trillions of miles that are driven each year. Things that are so highly unlikely that you'll never think about them suddenly become day-to-day -day occurrences um, when you look at all of the, the compounding factors. And we really don't have a good definition yet of what that standard operation should be um, to certify. So immediate needs, software interface, certification standards, um, and even culpability, like when does culpability stop um, in the age of recorded data? That's something that's, that I think is very, very um, uh, interesting. Politically, you're even seeing like politicians today are losing office for things that they said 30 or 40 years ago because now their statements from 30 or 40 years ago are searchable. It's not hard for me to, to search keywords that are 
highly inappropriate in somebody's speech because now I can do a text-to-speech or speech-to-text converter on everything they said and I can pull that up and so it will show up on, on public uh, information forms rather quickly. We're not used to that being applied to us personally for things like that ambulance situation in the traffic jam. And, and, um, uh, it's interesting because the discussion last night led to the analysis that you may not know if, if you're a good person when you die because the data might be out there that eventually show that you made decisions that made the world a much worse place um, and you just didn't know about it. And so, um, I think that's the key issue though, legally, you have to know. Because exactly. law, law, law is based on what you should reasonably know. And so it goes to the, the second step, which is once we get the tools in place to do these simulations, at what point should we start using the tools to make decisions? Like, as personal drivers, like if I choose to go out and I know that my going out to buy groceries is going to cause a traffic jam, I know that. You know, I know it could happen, so how, what percent liable am I for the creation of that traffic jam? You know, we, we are not very good, societal, societally speaking, at how do we agglomerate impacts that collectively are horrible, but individually are ignorable. Um, a good example of that is emissions. Global warming. I, I can't point to the amount of CO2 and say, I, I know that I caused this much last year, but I can't point to a, a damage that was a result of me. Um, a traffic jam is a great situation. Everybody in the jam is, is causing the jam. Um, so I can't point to one particular person and say they're at fault. But uh, we need to figure out how to do that. Um, and I think the transportation planners, the system level planners, are probably the ones that are most equipped at doing some of the high level analysis there. But it'll be a hard argument to make to the public. I don't envy you at all. No. Um, I, I have to run, unfortunately, but i leave you with this answer. Frankly, I'm always afraid the board will continue. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, any other questions? Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.